So this morning, we're going to be picking, off, picking up where we left off a couple weeks ago in Hebrews chapter 2. And as you know, I've been taking it kind of slow, um, but this week we're going to go ahead and finish off chapter 2. And in case you weren't with us or you're just now joining us or this is the first time you're watching this online, um, wherever, whether it's hearing it or watching it later on, um, I just want to give you just a quick reminder of what we've covered so far here in, in this chapter. Um, the writer concluded the first half of Hebrews chapter 2 by stating that Christ has tasted death for everyone. And in so doing, Christ not only secures our salvation, but also demonstrates his superiority over angels. Well, in the rest of the chapter that we're going to be covering today, he will further explain what it means for Christ to taste death for everyone. So as we go through the rest of this chapter, the writer will now go on to inform us how Jesus accomplished that, what were the results, and how it benefits God's people, how it benefits you and me as believers in Christ. And so what I hope that this message will do, by the end of this message today, I hope that you see that by becoming a man and experiencing the trials of temptation and the agony of death, Jesus Christ, our faithful high priest, accomplished the following three things. He destroyed the power of Satan. He is now able to help those who are being tempted. And he provides full propitiation for the sins of his people. And as I normally do before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask him to speak powerfully to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we adore you, we praise you, we glorify you for all the wonderful things that you've done, for who you are, sending your son to die for us. Even though there's many who are going through difficult times right now, Lord, you're still there. You're, you'll always be a constant. You'll always be absolute. You, you're just, you're truth. You're amazing and beautiful. And I just love that you, what you've done for us and what you're going to continue to do for us. And so now we ask that you speak powerfully to us now through your word. Through this message, through your word here that we're about to read. And you will show us things that will totally blow our minds away, Lord. Things that we had no clue about. Things that will just make us see everything with a, in a whole new way. So comfort us. Be with us, Lord. Remove all distractions. We want to hear from you now. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 2. We'll be picking up in verse 10. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through suffering, through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. And again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. In the previous section that, uh, that we covered a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, the author of Hebrews demonstrated 
the superiority of Christ over the angels and his glory achieving death as the last Adam. Further, his suffering unto death was not indiscriminate or pointless. See, Jesus tasted death for everyone. In other words, his suffering was substitutionary. What's also interesting, what I found interesting about the phrase tasted death for everyone is that it also, it's also a reference to the position of a cupbearer. You see, in Old Testament days, whenever a king was given something to drink, his cupbearer would take the first sip. That way, if the winemaker had it in for his royal boss, the cupbearer would drop dead instead of the king. Wouldn't you like that job as the cupbearer? I'm sure it paid pretty good for a short amount of time. Um, so you see, the point being that Jesus is our cupbearer. Which is why he prayed in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so by looking at it this way, you can see that he truly, that he truly tasted death so that we might live. Quoting from Psalm chapter Eight, we also learn in verses 5 through 9 that Jesus' humanity enabled him to regain the dominion man lost when the first Adam fell, at the garden, fell in the Garden of Eden. And so now because he has regained that glory and honor, believers today, if you're sitting here today as a born-again believer, you also now share in his kingly dominion. And in one day, when he establishes his kingdom, we shall reign with him in glory and honor. And I'm so excited for that day. I'm so excited. We will all be reunited as believers, past, present. I will see my mother. Robin will see her mother. You will see your loved ones. And it's just going to be, more importantly, we're going to be with Christ. We're going to see him face to face. We shall reign with him. Now, again, I, I bring these things up again, uh, things we covered last time we were here together, because now he still has Psalm 8 in mind as he writes, verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. However, he now shifts the focus to God the Father's role in our salvation and in the mission of Christ. See, this is an important point because Christianity, at its heart, is Trinitarian. We worship and serve a triune God who, at, who as Father, Son, and Spirit has acted for our salvation. There's no division between the Father's will to save and the, so and the Son's will to save. Just as the Father is determined to save, so also the Son and the Spirit are determined to save. Each carries out separate functions in the economy of salvation, but their salvation to save sinful humanity is unified. Now, in verse 10, the author uses two prepositional phrases which describe two facets of the Father's work in the history of, of redemption. First, God is the one for whom and through whom all things exist. The Father creates for his glory. He is both the beginning and end of creation. Now, the words there are reminiscent of what it says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 6 and 7. And there it says, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. 
Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who bears my name and is created for my glory, I have formed them. I have made them. The second prepositional phrase, in, in, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. That there is a remarkable summary of the gospel. Few gospel summaries in scripture so beautifully capture the work and ministry of Jesus uh, that we see in this prepositional phrase in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 here. Christ, my friends, came to do many things. He came to redeem sinners. He came to, sell, to save sinful humanity. He came to forgive sin. He even came to provide us, to provide you with righteousness. But more, he came to adopt us as sons and daughters to glory. These words provide a gospel summary that focuses on the relational and familial aspects of the gospel. The gospel transforms believers into children of God and also siblings, siblings of the Lord, Lord Jesus. We see then in both these prepositional phrases that God has both created and redeemed us for his glory. Our purpose is to bring the glory of God into greater visibility. To be the public display of the glory of God both now and for all of eternity. Thus, we become sons and daughters to glory in order to magnify the glory of God for all, the entire world to see. And so now, the main point of verse 10 is the fittingness of the Father's plan to redeem humanity through a perfect and suffering Savior. The justice of God demanded a substitutionary atonement for the forgiveness of sins. This verse, verse 10, hints at the need of the active and passive obedience of Christ in order to secure redemption and to atone for our sins. That Christ became perfect through sufferings does not imply that Jesus was somehow sinful prior to crucifixion. See, the author of Hebrews regularly emphasizes the sinlessness of Christ during his incarnation. If you want an example of that, it's, it's in chapter 4, verse 15. Instead, the phrase made perfect refers to Jesus' unflinch, unflinching submission to the Father in the face of escalating difficulties. In the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, Jesus was obedient to the point of death. Even the most shameful kind of death, death on a cross. Because of Christ's perfect obedience to the Father, Jesus has now become the pioneer of salvation. A um, cartoon in a, in a newspaper a long time ago depicted President Clinton bidding farewell to U.S. troops leaving for Bosnia. Don't do anything I wouldn't do, he calls. The next frame is one of the soldiers saying, we already are. See, our Lord doesn't simply say, good luck down there. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. No, not at all. He says, I've marched down the same road you're marching. I have fought the same battles you're now fighting. That's what it means to be made perfect through suffering. Jesus was always perfect. But the fact that he suffered like us 
makes him the perfect pioneer for us. Now, in, also in some Bible translations, it doesn't say pioneer, it says captain. Jesus is the captain, the leader, the advance of our salvation. This has wonderful implications because a captain makes all the arrangements for the march. And Jesus makes all the arrangements for our progress as Christians. A captain gives the commands to the troops, go or stay, or do this. Jesus commands us as our captain. A captain leads the way and is the example, is an example to his men. And Jesus does this for us. He's that example for us. A captain encourages his men. Jesus encourages us too. A captain rewards his troops. And Jesus rewards his followers. Spurgeon said this. Now, seeing that it is the will of the Lord to lead us to glory by the captain of our salvation. I want you to be worthy of your leader. Do you not think that sometimes we act as if we had no captain? We fancy that we have to fight our way to heaven by the might of our own right hand and by our own skill. But it is not so. If you start before your captain gives you the order to march, you will have to come back again. And if you try to fight apart from your captain, you will rue the day or ruin the day. Now, verse 11. And the Old Testament citations that follow in verses 12 and 13 further explain the activity of the father and son in bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Both the one who sanctifies, which is Jesus, and those who are sanctified, us believers, come from one source, the initiative and plan of the Father. Since Christ, who is the Father's commissioned Redeemer, and the church, those elected by the Father to redemption, are united in the plan and purposes of God for the history of redemption, Jesus is not ashamed to call us, to call you brothers and sisters. As the Old Testament citations in verses 12 and 13 confirm, the accent, the accent, I'm sorry, the accent in this phrase is rooted in the reality that because believers are Christ's brothers and sisters, we're also children of God. The first citation in verse 12 is from Psalm chapter 22, verse 22. Whereas the other two in verse 13 come from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. Now, if you take the time or if you've read it or if you know Psalm 22, um, when you read it in its entire context, it's clearly messianic and points towards the death and resurrection of Christ. There in that, ver in that psalm, it describes that after the, messia the Messiah undergoes tremendous suffering, he is vindicated in receiving life from the dead. Yet, as the author of Hebrews highlights, this risen Messiah invites his brothers, his disciples, to join in the celebration of the finished work of salvation. And so similarly, the quotation from Isaiah chapter 8 shows that the Old Testament already hinted that those who trusted in the Lord were children of God. These Old Testament citations that are mentioned here remind the reader, remind us who are reading, remind the Jew who was reading this 
uh, in the ori like originally that there is a distinctively Christian way to read the Old Testament. This is further proof that the law and the prophets bear witness to Christ. They bear witness to Christ. In some instances, it's obvious, such as the Messianic Psalms and prophetic predictions about the coming Messiah. But in other instances, uh, instances, the Old Testament more subtly points to Christ through theological patterns and redemptive historical themes. But whatever the case may be, the author of Hebrews reminds us that the message of the Old Testament is fundamentally messianic, which is why church, my, my fellow believer, my brother and sister in Christ, why it's so important that the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, that it be read in light of its fulfillment in Christ. Now, there are many that oppose capital punishment. When a notoriously evil person, such as a terrorist or a mass murderer, mass murderer dies, most of us, most of us would say it was fitting that he die. After all, he was responsible for the deaths of many innocent people. Capital punishment serves justice and warns those who may consider committing a similar crime that they will be executed. And so we can rightly say it was fitting for that despicable man to die. But we would be shocked if someone whose father had died of natural causes said it was fitting for him to die. Or consider a good man who never did anything to hurt others. To the contrary, he did many good deeds, did a lot of good stuff to help those in need, even at a great personal cost. He always took kind interest in those whom society rejected. He had a special love for children. He labored to the point of exhaustion in serving others. If this kind of man were executed, how could anyone say it was fitting that he die? But that's precisely what the author of Hebrews has told us about the death of Jesus Christ. He says that it was fitting for God to put his own son to death. This verse here must have jarred. It must have completely shocked his Jewish Christian readers. They were struggling with the offense of the cross. Although they had believed in Jesus, they were being tempted by unbelieving Jews who said, how could Jesus be the Messiah if he died? Our Messiah will conquer all our enemies, not die. Your Messiah didn't die a heroic death or even a normal death. Rather, he died as a common criminal in the most shameful death imaginable on a Roman cross. You want us to believe that this man was our, is our savior? You've got to be kidding. So the author here is showing that Jesus' death did not disqualify him as Messiah and Savior. It didn't mean that he was inferior to the angels who do not die. In fact, Jesus' death was God's very means not only to glorify Jesus, but also bring many sons to glory. It was part of God's eternal plan. And so the author wants to remove the offense of the cross for his readers so that they will not be ashamed to proclaim it as the very power and wisdom of God and to rejoice in it. 
Verse 10, therefore, it shows that it was fitting for Jesus to die in order to affect our salvation in line with God's eternal plan and his perfect attributes. There's obviously more to say just in those three verses, but I now want to move on to the rest of this chapter and read that out and explain some things about it. So let's, if you have your Bible still open, I'll be picking up in verse 14 and reading all the way to the end. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since, himself, for since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. In verses 14 through 16, the author shows us that Jesus' humanity, Jesus' humanity enabled him to disarm Satan and to deliver us from death. Now, many of you know, and some of you may not know, but angels cannot die. And and so what this here tells us is that Jesus didn't come to save angels. He, that wasn't his purpose. That's why he didn't, he didn't come for that. He came to save humans. He came to save humanity. This meant that he had to take on himself flesh and blood and become a man. Only then could he die, and through his death, defeat Satan. The word destroy doesn't mean annihilate. For it is obvious, it's clear that Satan is still alive and is busy today. He's still working today, and we see hints of that right now as there's growing escalation there in Eastern Europe. The word actually means render inoperative, to make ineffective. And so the truth is, yeah, Satan isn't destroyed. But here's the thing, he is disarmed. So now you may be looking at verse 14 and are probably wondering, so in what sense did Satan have the power of death? See, well, the Bible is clear in both the New Testament and the Old Testament that the final authority of death is in the hands of God. The book of Job says that Satan can, only, uh, can do only that which, which God has permitted. Because Satan is the author of sin, and sin brings death. In this sense, Satan exercises power in the realm of death. In fact, in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus calls him a murderer. See, Satan uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over the lives of people. How many people do you know, even Christians, are so scared of dying, aren't living just for the glory of God, aren't seeing the wonder, the beauty of life, the, how God can use them in so many amazing ways, but 
They're scared now of dying. They're scared of COVID. They're scared of these diseases. They're scared of Omicron. They're scared of, you know, they're scared of dying. When really, they should just be living the life that God has given and living it to the fullest. Again, that's what Satan does. He robs you of that joy. He wants to take it away. He uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over the lives of people. His kingdom, the devil's kingdom, is one of darkness and death. So those of us that have trusted in Jesus Christ have once and for all been delivered from Satan's authority and from the terrible fear of death. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ has given us victory. It's given us victory, ladies and gentlemen. We must realize that Jesus Christ didn't take on himself the nature of angels in order to save fallen angels. No. Instead, he stooped lower than the angels to become man. And not just man in general, but he became a Jew, a part of the seed of Abraham. The Jews, just like in many places today, were a despised and hated race. And yet, our Lord and Savior became a Jew. Now, in the last two verses of our passage, the writer of this book shows us that Jesus' humanity enables him to be, be a sympathetic high priest to his people. Being pure spirits who have never suffered, the angels, they can't identify with us in our weaknesses and needs, but Jesus can. While he was here on earth, Jesus was made like unto his brethren in that he experienced the sinless infirmities of human nature. He knew what it was like to be a helpless baby, a growing child, a maturing adolescent. He knew what it was like to be tired. He knew what it was like to be hungry. He knew what it was like to be thirsty. He knew what it was to be despised and rejected, to be lied about and falsely accused. He experienced physical suffering and death. All of this was part of his training for his heavenly ministry as high priest. Now, if you want an example of a man who was not a merciful and faithful high priest, then read the account of Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 27 through 36. Here was a high priest who didn't even lead his own sons into a faithful walk with God. Eli even accused broken-hearted Hannah of being drunk. Well, Jesus Christ is both, both merciful and faithful. He is merciful towards people and faithful toward God. He can never fail in his priestly ministries. He made the necessary sacrifice for our sins so that we may be reconciled to God. He didn't need to make a sacrifice for himself because he was sinless. Jesus was sinless. But what happens when those of us that have been saved are now tempted to sin? Well, we're told here again, he stands ready to help us. He was tempted when he was here on earth. But no temptation ever conquered him. See, because 
He has defeated every enemy. He is able to give us the grace that we need to overcome temptation. The Hebrew word for help in verse 18 is sakor, and literally means to run to the cry of a child. It means to bring help when it is needed. Now I point this out because in chapter 1 we saw that angels are able to serve us. But the truth is, but the truth is they're not able to succor us in our times of temptation. Only Jesus, only Jesus Christ can do that. And he can do that because he became a man and suffered and died. Now, it might be good at this point to explain the difference between our Lord's ministry as high priest and his ministry as uh, our advocate, as 1 John chapter 2, was, verse 1 says. As our high, high priest, our Lord is able to give us grace to keep us from sinning when we are tempted. If we do sin, then he is our advocate that represents us before the throne of God and forgives us when we are sincerely, when we sincerely confess our sins to him. Both of these ministries are involved in his present work of intercession. And it's this intercessory ministry that is the guarantee of our, the guarantee of our eternal salvation. Verse 18 reminds us to look backward to the temptations and sufferings of Christ, to find encouragement in meeting our own temptations. See, this is a regular pattern throughout Hebrews. The Christian faith continues, continuously alternates between looking backward and looking forward. We look forward to the hope of resurrection and the perfection of salvation, of our salvation, but we also look backward to the life and ministry of Christ. In so doing, we look back at the source of our salvation. When we pray to Christ to rescue us from sin, we pray to the one who has himself walked through suffering and temptation. He is, my friends, no stranger to our difficulties. He understands you. He knows you. He knows what you're going through. He truly has been made like his brothers and sisters in every way. As I begin to conclude here, these two introductory chapters that we covered so far are truly remarkable. In the midst of the author's argument that Christ is superior to the angelic host, we have already seen tremendous glimpses of the gospel of grace. This gospel is a solution to our biggest problems in life, from death to the devil. Yet because of the nature of the gospel, it's also the solution to our day-to-day -day trials and temptations. Christ, my friends, sympathizes with your weakness at every level. As your incarnate brother, he suffered and was tempted just like you. So now, therefore, you can approach him with confidence and with faith. So whatever you're going through, come to him. Come to him and just let him know. Give those burdens, those, all those anxieties, all those things going on with you. Surrender them to Christ. Allow him to give you the peace and comfort that he wants to envelop you with.
trust in your own understanding. Don't trust in the things of this world. Trust in Him. He is the only way. He is the true source of everything, of our salvation, of our redemption, of our peace, of our comfort, everything. Fear not. He has overcome. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that man who hung on the cross, he overcame. And what he's saying to you is, you could do it too, my brother and sister. Let me help you. Let me guide you. Let me strengthen you. Will you allow him to do that? I know it's hard, but there's no other hands that are more secure than those pierced hands of Jesus. Those pierced hands ought to be reminders to all of you, to all of you watching and listening of the lengths, the length that Jesus went to show you how much he cares for you and loves you. Again, remember that he was sinless. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't commit a single sin, and yet he suffered and died as a criminal. Well, he suffered as a criminal and hung on the cross as a criminal. He didn't deserve it. We all did, though. You all did, though. You know all the horrible, terrible things you've done. I know I have. I've done some pretty messed up things and I've hurt a lot of people, a lot of people that I loved. And if I could take it back, I would. And I used to live with that guilt for a long, long time. But when I rededicated my life, I, he finally gave me that freedom that I was looking for. I no longer had that guilt. And to the people that I harmed and that I hurt, I was able to come and ask for forgiveness. And for those that had hurt me, I was able to forgive. That also brings up something interesting. Is there someone out there that you need to forgive? Or you need to ask for their forgiveness or maybe there's someone out there that has asked for you to forgive them and you're like no I can't you've hurt me too much well we need to have the mind and the heart of Jesus and we know that he wouldn't ever say that to, to any of you he forgave you for everything that you did every single offense and so likewise, you ought to have that heart towards everybody. I know it's hard. Again, it's difficult. But he will give you that peace that you need. He will give it to you. You just have to trust him. And you have to let it go and say, okay, Lord, I trust you. You're going to guide me through this. It hurts. But I know this is the right thing to do. And you'll see. And it just brings freedom. It brings peace into your life. Forgive just as Christ forgave you. Jesus, to sum this up again, Jesus sympathizes with your weaknesses. He understands you. And so maybe you're watching or you're here today or, you know, you walked away from the Lord or maybe you just feel like you're far and you feel like you've blown it this week and it's never too late, ladies and gentlemen. It's never too late to come to him. It's never, he will never say, you know what, you, you really blew it this time. I'm, not, I'm, not sure. I'm going to give you a time out. You stay there for for a month or two and 
or say this, these many prayers and then I'll forgive you. No. He wants to freely forgive you. All you got to do is say, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I messed up sincerely with your heart and say, I sinned. He doesn't want you to stay down. He doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to get up and keep walking. He wants you to keep walking with him. And you can stay down there as long as you want. But he's just going to keep there, standing there with his arm ex hand extended and say, come on, let's go. So however long you want to stay down there, it's up to you. But he doesn't want you to stay down there. Just reach out and grab his arm or grab his hand and he'll pull you back up. But you, you got to make the effort to extend your hand too. Walk with him and he will be with you. Ask him for, your, for forgiveness and he will. He will freely do that. Again, you'll get that peace that you're searching and seeking. And now I want to take a minute to talk to those who have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and who have been living their lives, whether it's 20 years and 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, or 90 years, and have been far from God. You've lived your life the way you wanted to live and it hasn't worked out for you. It just brought you and brought you more problems, more issues. You feel empty. There's no fulfillment. Well, in Christ, you can find that fulfillment. You can find that hope. I'm not saying that life will be perfect from here on end. You have to, I want you to know that there's still going to be bumps in the road. But when you have Christ in your corner... When you're a believer, it makes these, these bumps become a lot easier to endure. And so if there's any of you out there that see your need for a Savior, you see your need for Jesus, you recognize that, man, I, I've completely blown it. I need Jesus. I need him I want him to be the source of my salvation. Well, I want to invite you to the cross. I want to invite you, uh, lead you there and, and so that you can receive him. So you can accept him as your Lord and Savior. You could, so you can unload all your sins before the cross so that he may wipe them all clean. And he will do that for you. If you just sincerely ask for forgiveness. He will forgive you. And so if that's you and you're ready to for a new life, to be born again, to begin a new life in Christ as a believer, as a brother and sister in Christ, to be a child of God, wherever you're at, just close your eyes and bow your head. Maybe sitting on your couch right now or sitting in your car or wherever you may be. Just silently close your eyes and pray this prayer with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. And now, Lord, I ask you to please forgive me. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And so at this very moment now, I repent and turn from my sins and confess you you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept your forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. 
Lord, I now ask you to fill me. Fill me abundantly, more than abundantly with the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. For those of you who prayed that, I want to welcome you to the family of God, and I welcome you, and you're now my brother and sister in Christ, and you have a whole family of believers everywhere, no matter. You would be surprised, even if you think there's none around, you'd be surprised that there's, you have brothers and sisters in, near you. But if you need some help in finding a church, or need a Bible, or whatever it may be, again, contact us if you want to help in your next steps. Um, if you're here locally in the area in El Paso, Texas, we are in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. We'd love to meet you and talk to you and hear your story of how you came to know Jesus Christ, how you, you know, how exactly you prayed that prayer. Um, and we want to pray for you some more. You know, we want to also, I think here you'll be able to meet some great people and definitely learn the Bible. And uh, the Lord will definitely speak to you in that sense, too. But I want to thank you again for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and conclude this message online. And um, we hope to see you again next week. It's going to be another great time, another great message. We'll be in Chapter 3 next week. So thank you for joining us. May you have a great week. Be blessed. Be a salt and light wherever you are. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.